Before introducing our guest tonight, a few thank yous. First and foremost, I would like to thank Carol Hoffman Collins, class of 1963, whose generous grant has made the Global Scholar Series possible. So she's not with us, but we could applaud anyway. As you all know, last Friday, the Nobel Prize Committee awarded this year's Peace Prize 2012 to the European Union. Undoubtedly, in recognition of the contribution to prosperity and peace that the EU has made for 50 plus years in Europe. But at this juncture, there are heavy big clouds hanging over Europe and it's a big question mark, what is the future of Europe? And so we are delighted to have a speaker tonight who will give us an answer to this question. <laughs> Constanzus Stelzenmüller is the senior transatlantic fellow with the German Marshall Fund of the United States in Berlin. Her broad expertise comprises transatlantic relations, international security, international human rights, international law, NATO, EU foreign policy, etc. In a former life, she was an editor in the political section of Die Zeit, uh, the most well-known German weekly for 10 years. She continues to be a regular contributor on American and US television and radio, and contributor to major newspapers and policy journals. Constanze Stelzenmüller is the chair of the Academic Advisory Board of the German Foundation on Peace Research. And particularly interesting, she is the chair of the German section of Women in International Security, WIS. She holds a doctorate in law from the University of Bonn and an MA in public administration from the Kennedy School. Since this past summer, she's also in charge of the very well-known Transatlantic Trends, which is an annual survey of public opinion in the United States and European countries. And over a faculty seminar dinner last night, she told us the results, some of the results of the latest trends which was fascinating, and we had a wonderful discussion, and I anticipate the same thing will happen tonight. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Constanze Stelzenmüller. Hi, everyone. I understand that for the students, this is mandatory, and you all have to write reports about it tomorrow. I'm sorry to do this to you. Uh, why the faculty is here is somewhat less clear to me, uh, but presumably somebody made it mandatory for them as well. Um, I want to say thank you very much. I'm re I've, been, well, I've been deeply touched, basically, since my arrival here, just by the fact that I've been invited to this wonderful place, um, that I've been hosted so generously by Eva and uh, Jennifer and by her colleagues and by the wonderful discussions I've had in class here. Um, it's been a really rich experience and I look forward to one and a half more days of it. Sadly, Friday morning I have to go back to Germany. You, you still get to stay. Um, I, um, as some of you have heard in class, I'm a foreign service brat. I grew up sort of all over the world. Um, and I did have the privilege to spend part of my childhood in, in America, four years uh, in the 70s in Washington, and then uh, three years again, as Eva said, here at graduate school. And um, I have enormous admiration and affection for um, the upper echelons, the top echelons of American education. I think the principles, the values, the commitment that um, American colleges liberal arts colleges and universities bring to educating the best and the brightest is just amazing. And I think you're all very lucky to be here. I wish I could have had the same experience, but it sounds like you're, getting, uh, you're having a lot of fun and learning a great deal. The other thing I wanted to say, because you just mentioned that I'm the chairwoman of the German section of WISE. 
uh, I got a very enthusiastic newsletter from the woman who, in, in, who recruited me to WISE, Women International Security, in the first place, more than 10 years ago. Um, and because there wasn't a German section yet, um, I, of course, had to join WISE USA. And I was recruited to it by one of the founders of WISE USA. And some of you here may know the name, Catherine McArdle Kelleher. Guess what? She's a Mount Holyoke alumna. <laughs> so anyway, she said, uh, you know, go tell them. And, <laughs> and she went on to great things. I will tell you, um, she, she did her undergrad here. She went to MIT, got a PhD in MIT, and was one of the first women in America to become a very senior nuclear theologian, as I like to call them, nuclear security expert. And in the Clinton administration, she was, an, I think, an undersecretary Secretary of Defense for, um, for the Eastern European states. So go for it, you know. That's where you can take it. Um, Eva has very kindly asked me uh, to, to speak to you tonight about Europe's future. I didn't arrange the Nobel Peace Prize, but it does come in handy um, because it kind of fits into uh, the general drift of the remarks that I was going to make. And with that, I'm going to start with my 89 pages of prepared lecture. I'm just saying this to scare Eva. It's been growing ever since we've been talking about this. Um, no, I'm going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes, as I was asked, and then we'll do a Q&A, hopefully. If you have questions or anything is unclear, or I just speak too fast, which I mostly do, just please raise your hand and interrupt me in between and ask for a clarification, okay? This is uh, not supposed to go over everybody's heads. So it's become trite, of course, these days to say that Europe is in crisis. And of course, not just an economic crisis or a sovereign debt crisis, but a crisis of institutions and indeed of the very notion of the European Union as a political utopia. And at the same time, it appears to have become highly unfashionable to issue any but the direst of predictions for Europe's future, whether speaking of the tragedy of the European Union, George Soros, asking, is Europe kaput? Last edition of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much for that or predicting that Europe's golden era has ended and that the outlook is a silver age at best and an iron age of war and destruction at worst, as Stephen Philip Kramer did in the last edition of the Washington Quarterly. Thank you very much. Frankly, the Peace Prize is a bit of respite from all this. And of course, let's not even get into the comment on Friday's decision by that certain committee in Norway, right? Remember the expression being Thorbjorn? Um, and of course, um, there has been a great deal of heated exchange on whose fault it all is. And regardless of fault, who is responsible for leading the charge and saving Europe from itself? Sorry, no prizes for guessing this one. That's not to say that any of these assertions is untrue. In fact, considerable truth and probability attaches to them. The question that I want to discuss tonight is whether catastrophe, meaning disintegration of Europe, is inevitable or whether there is indeed a way forward. Also, I'll spend a couple of minutes at the end on the now almost conventional wisdom that the Germans have become the Americans of Europe, the superpower we all love to hate, but which will organize the airlift, pay for the plan, and finally embrace us all in a kind of Pax Economica Teutonica. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm liable to joke about these things. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> so the breathtaking complexity of the issues raised by the current crisis has led a number of writers on European affairs to turn to the scenario method. And some of you will perhaps know that this is a method that was first developed by military and corporate planners after World War II as a tool for developing strategy. Scenarios, of course, are not predictions, but intelligent, informed guesses about the future. As an intellectual technique, scenario development is somewhat akin to laying a series of wooden planks, carpentered, carpentered with exquisite skill, of course, and in finest teak, on the edge of an abyss pointing forward, adding another at the end and then another, and another. This method also, in my view, has the distinct advantage of allowing the writer to glide over some of the fiendish technicalities of economic and political governance involved. And not being an economist or a policymaker myself, this is an opportunity I'm very happy to not pass up. That said, the very genuine use of developing projections is that they permit thinking through a situation to its happy or bitter end and then to walk back over the planks to the terra firma 
of current reality, identifying in the process plausible and less plausible causalities, driving factors and potential tipping factors, which in the process could bring you to a desired outcome or help you steer clear of disaster. So tonight, I'm going to offer you two futures of Europe, a utopia and a dystopia, up to you to, to decide which is which. I've decided to, decided to make it so that it's not all that easy to decide. And I also promise to not stop there. I'll come back to the, review the terra firma as it looks at present and hazard a couple of predictions. And yes, I will talk about my own country. So that brings me to my first scenario. Looking back in 2022, over the past decade, it has become clear that the European Union and Europe reached the peak of their power in the first decade of the millennium, never to regain it again. At the time, the financial crises of 2008-2014 seemed, like its predecessor crisis, such as the Balkans Wars, to be one of those cathartic eruptive events that had always inevitably, it seemed, tipped the EU into further and deeper integration. Instead, it turned out that Europe, like America, was experiencing a slow and gradual decline. I, I think I mentioned I was going to be a little bit provocative, right? As part of a larger erosion of the West, as well as a global power shift towards the East. Greece's departure from the Eurozone in late 2012 marked the beginning of a much greater process of unraveling. The Eurozone itself collapsed in 2017. The European Union still exists in the way that the Holy Roman Empire continued to exist until 1806, well beyond the rise of mercantilist nation states in Europe. The UK was the only country to leave formally in 2014. The other big member states, such as France, Germany, and Poland, never bothered, since intergovernmentalism, also known as the union method, a term coined by German Chancellor Angela Merkel, served their needs very well. And the European institutions, the Commission, the Parliament, and the Court had atrophied through neglect. Some European countries continued to do quite well for a while. Germany went on doing a raging trade with China until the Chinese learned to make better cars and better tools at lower prices. France has been building nuclear power plants all over the world for governments shocked by the decay of President for Life Vladimir Putin's Russia and the collapse of the Saudi monarchy. And the UK remains the world's leading producer of sophisticated surveillance technology. <laughs> Overall, however, Europe went into recession for more than half a decade, government debts remain crippling, and economic growth and innovation have moved elsewhere. The fact that the return to national currencies entangled most European companies in decade-long lawsuits over the revaluation of contracts, assets, and debts did not help European competitiveness. Many ended up filing for bankruptcy. Contrary to the bleakest predictions, war did not return to Europe, at least not to the economically relatively prosperous northern countries. But the Balkans were embroiled in festering conflict once more after an ultra-nationalist ultra government in Belgrade, which swept to power after Serbia's rejection by the EU, forcibly retook Kosovo. The littoral nations of the Eastern Mediterranean are fighting each other over access to natural gas fields beneath the seabed, although some cynics did note that discussions in NATO became easier after Turkey annexed the rest of Cyprus. In Ireland, Portugal, Spain and Greece, where governments toppled after their countries plunged into recession, public spending underwent drastic cuts, unemployment rates rocketed upwards, nationwide strikes, violent riots, and soar soaring organized crime rates have made public authority and governance a notional affair. Hungary and several other European countries have been the scene of pogroms against the Roma and other minorities. Emigration from Europe's periphery to the Pacific region has been rising steadily. Beijing and Seoul are considering quotas for European <coughs> guest workers. Even in the comparatively staid and stable North, persistent low growth and austerity budgets forced governments to make unpopular choices. Nationalism, populism, and xenophobia rose far and wide. And after the Schengen Agreement crumbled because of massive migration flows emanating from wide-scale civil unrest in Northern Africa and the Middle East, Borders went up again all across Europe. Rich European parents are now sending their children who learned their first words of Mandarin and English in kindergarten to elite boarding schools in China and India. I don't know what's to laugh about. <laughs> Actually, it might be educational to send them to boarding school in China. Security policy under these conditions has been focused on intelligence, policing, and border control. 
European governments had already made massive investment in these areas in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and correspondingly neglected their defense spending, much to the annoyance of their American allies. Ten years later, the economic crisis, spiraling technology costs and inward-looking policies decisively shifted spending away from external and into internal security. Now there are surveillance cameras everywhere, not just in the UK. And almost all Europeans have electronic identity chips, like pets, farm animals, and freight goods. But that seems a small price to pay for the fact that there has not been a large-scale terrorist attack in Europe since 2005. The region's fearful and increasingly elderly publics expect no less than total security from their governments these days, and beleaguered governments are hypersensitive to their voters' wishes, wishes which they poll each week. <laughs> Still, it's not all 1984. The explosion of personal connectivity has led to a happy flowering of local civic initiatives and alternate living models. All this led in 2016 to the creation of three flourishing new EU institutions, the European Intelligence Committee, the Border Security Agency, and the European Paramilitary Police Corps, the latter equipped with short and medium range weaponized drones. Some seasoned political commentators in Europe are therefore arguing that this proves Pace and Gala Merkel that the EU does remain alive and well, and even in times of protracted crisis. After all, even Beijing and Washington have praised the Europeans for the impressive way in which they have been succeeding in staunching cyber attacks, as well as the inflow of illegal and, for that matter, pretty much any migrants, weapons, and drugs from the numerous failing states in Europe's periphery. And surely stability is the key to reestablishing anything, any international order. What indeed is freedom worth without safety? NATO has been surprisingly useful under the circumstances. Of course, the Americans are only nominal members. They felt that would be less of a hassle than formally resigning from what one member of the House termed a bunch of feckless free riders. <laughs> At any rate, they're preoccupied with their own border control issues, as well as having to keep a sharp eye from afar, in as much as Congress will permit, on rising tensions in South Asia and the South China Seas. Nor are there any territorial attacks on Europe to fear. Russia isn't strong enough to tra threaten Europe with turning off the taps on its pipelines, and the Putin and Prokhorov clans are grateful for a reasonably stable and legal source of income. But NATO command structures and force generation processes have helped with the odd spot of crisis management in Europe. In contrast, Atlanticism has not fared well. Indeed, some Europeans and not a few Americans argue that the term itself has outlived its purpose. The disintegration of the Eurozone produced a cascade of negative knock-on economic effects in Europe, in the US, given the deep exposure of US financial markets and US multinationals in Europe. And matters, of course, were only made worse when struggling European companies closed their plants in America and Congress voted to cut off trade ties to Europe. In the UN, as well as in the international finance and trade organizations, Americans and Europeans have had to relinquish some of their powers and voting rights as executive organs were expanded and redesigned to take into account a half dozen emergent and confident powers. In the G20, a growing group of mercantilist non-Western governments are stridently demanding that the US and Europe subscribe to rules of the road, protecting state-run enterprises and exempting them from any kind of conditionality based on internal governance, much less human rights and things of that kind. So the only sneaking hope depressed policymakers in Washington and Euro European capitals entertain on this latter count is that Chinese and Russian business leaders appear to be fed up with their government's attempts to run the economy and willing to take them on, cheered along by small and determined middle classes and a raucous blogosphere. But Western policymakers are not sure whether this hope is shared by their larger publics who appear to care mostly about their own future. And there we will leave my first set of planks in the air. And that takes me to my second scenario where the European Union has risen out of the ashes of the economic crisis and transformed not just itself but its neighborhood into an economic and political powerhouse whose transformative attraction in 2022 reaches far beyond its borders. Admittedly, the decision to create a genuine economic and fiscal union in 2014 and to lay the groundwork for a United States of Europe a couple of years later looked a lot more like an act of desperation at the time than a strategic choice. 
the Greek and Portuguese insolvencies, the bloody riots in Italy and Spain, and the emigration of most of the Irish, combined with the relentless onslaught of the markets and the intransigence of the ratings agencies, convinced exhausted European politicians and publics that anything was preferable to continuing a life on the edge of the abyss. So what happened in 2014 was that the first incremental steps of integration taken during the first years of the, the financial crisis were folded into the existing European treaties. At the same time, a commission was set up to write a constitution. It came into being in 2021 after two-thirds of Europe's 30 member states ratified the European Constitutional Treaty, but not without a furious and drawn-out battle between the northern and southern member state blocs about the future shape of Europe. The former led by whom? By Germany, of course, wanted a stability union that would federalize as few powers as possible, but automatically penalize any country that infringed the strict new austerity rules. The latter, led by the Italian prime minister, demanded a growth union that would provide for eurobonds a European central bank turned into a lender of last resort and Europe-wide stimulus programs. The compromise that was finally reached saw the Germans agreeing to federalism as Europe's basic operating principle, a European finance ministry, the Europeanization of debt, in return, I'm sorry, and investment packages for the most hard-hit states of Europe's periphery, in return for the cashiering of the common agricultural policy and solemn promises all around not to hold referenda on the Constitution. <laughs> this combination of steps convinced the markets and the ratings agencies that the Europeans meant business this time, and the continent's economy, boosted by newfound confidence in the effect of structural reforms, took off. Half a dozen member states, more, swiftly joined the Eurozone. Last but not least, the United Kingdom, after the Confederation of British, Ind British Industry and the city, threatened to move their operations to Poland, which had been the first to join. Europe is now governed by the EU Commission, which is headed by a directly elected president. I wouldn't go so far as my friend Vivian Schmidt, who suggested that this might be David Beckham. I think that's, <laughs> you know, I think that's sarcasm, and I think one shouldn't do sarcasm on serious topics. <laughs> Behind him stands a European great power directorate that consists of Germany, Poland, Sweden, and the UK. The French joined several years later, having undergone wrenching competitiveness reforms. And the other Europeans continue to be irritated, of course, by German smugness. But the 29 are agreed that one advantage of having a Germany with real power is that it stops talking about its moral superiority. <laughs> Much of Europe has been run for the past decade by technocratic governments, Voting abstention rates are high and public culture has become rather bland. Citizens don't seem to mind, but then they have come through a nasty scare and are now enjoying the fruits of their new prosperity. Safety is what matters. By the time the Europeans had worked through their economic problems and were able to pay attention to other issues, the hurtling page of pace of technological change had made their defense forces obsolete compared with China's or even America's where they were like a 1980s pocket calculator to the market-leading ultra-thin flexible iPad written with an AI designed by Ai Weiwei for Huawei Industries. <laughs> Yet, okay, that was silly, I admit. <laughs> Yet that turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it allowed the EU to start over. The first to go were outdated and, legacy, and costly legacy platforms like fighter bombers or aircraft carriers. The next step was European, Europeanization. Standards, doctrines, education, common forces, joint decision-making processes. London and Paris got to keep and modernize their nuclear weapons. But the European Defense Forces, the EDF, have a joint command, general staff college, a single operational headquarters in Great Britain, of course, and no more than 250,000 men and women under weapons at any time. They also have a unified air defense, coast guard, and border guards. This meant an enormous saving, well, actually the saving, of most of Europe's smaller um, armies, but even the big three breathed a sigh of relief. Wisely, however, the Europeans have directed the bulk of their new defense spending into knowledge superiority, signals and human intelligence, as well as strategic foresight and analysis capabilities. So NATO has, for all practical purposes, become the house of European defense with a guest room for the Americans in case they want to do a sleepover. But the US is very happy with the new division of labor, which allows it to concentrate on the Pacific region's many hotspots. It has neither the inclinations nor the spare assets for any serious additional engagements in Europe's periphery. 
Washington policymakers have in fact been reassured to see that Brussels has been willing to deploy special forces and drones, as well as stabilization forces when necessary. Well, mostly reassured. Behind closed doors, they note that it would help them with Congress if Brussels could consult with them before taking action. But from a US point of view, what really matters is that Europe has been throwing a spider's web of soft power over Eastern Europe and Northern Africa with the declared purpose of making the region more stable by making it more prosperous, more democratic, and better government. And with the common agricultural policy gone, it has become possible to extend deep free trade agreements all across Europe. Visa and citizenship policies were liberalized extensively after the EU Commission reviewed Eurostat's demographic databases. And the redesigned Erasmus Mundus scholarship now puts thousands of Ukrainians, Russians, Egyptians, and others through law, business, or public policy schools in Europe where they learn how liberal free market democracies are run. Are run. The Europeans are still not always finding it easy to speak with one voice on foreign policy, but it matters less since their periphery has become so much more stable. And also after the early disasters in Syria, Bahrain, and Lebanon, the near collapse of Saudi Arabia, and several rocky years of the Muslim Brotherhood in the driver's seat in Egypt, Turkey and the Gulf nations were sufficiently unsettled but by what they saw as Western nations just not getting it to take regional security matters into their own hands. Europeans and Americans have mixed feelings about this, but on the whole, they think that this is the better way to go, so they're having quiet joint talks with several friendly nations on how to lower the temperature a bit. The UN and other international institutions are still around, even if the regional security alliances have mostly taken over, providing for dispute settlement and a reasonable level of security. Not very ambitious. But Washington has found it difficult to get them, or in fact the Eurocrats, to discuss the issues it worries about and needs a strong and like-minded partner for, such as climate change, resource competition, and China's fragile economy. Europe, it appears, it has come to grips with itself and its own neighborhood, but is not ready yet to take on responsibility for other strategic regions or, for that matter, for issues of global concern. And that is where I will leave my second cent of planks hanging in space as well. And I'll walk back to terra firma. As I said, these are speculative scenarios, and occasionally, for purposes of illustration and emphasis, they are so to the point of caricature. My second scenario, that in which Europe transcends and transforms itself, appears to be the least likely one as seen to, as from today. And my first scenario, where Europe disintegrates and withdraws from the world, is clearly the worst possible outcome, not just for, for us, but I would suggest also for you. Still, both of these scenarios contain possible variants upon today's reality, and both of them, I think, contain elements of today's reality. Both contain risks, benefits, and opportunities for us in Europe and for you here in America. And that then brings me back to the third part on the terra firma. Terra firma, firm earth, um, such as it is, that being stability being a very relative concept these days. To start off, um, let's return to these notions of terminal European dysfunctionality and German, looming German hegemony. Those are not untrue, of course, but they are both incomplete and exaggerated. One of my old newspaper decides editors, the legendary Theo Zoma, liked to boom at terrified rookie editorial writers like me, first simplify, then exaggerate. <laughs> well, newspapers don't have a monopoly on that, and certainly not German newspapers. Take recent events in Europe. Contrary to most predictions, Europe's single currency, the euro, has not disappeared, nor have individual countries such as Greece left the eurozone. As things stand now, European policymakers appear to have convinced the markets that they will indeed do everything in their power to save the euro. It has even become conceivable again that other countries might join the 17-member eurozone. So, how did this come about? Three things happened recently to change the game in Europe. The European Central Bank stepped up in September and announced it would buy unlimited quantities of bonds of any member state that accepts the conditions of a bailout program. Its president, Mario Draghi, an Italian, famously said the ECB would do whatever it takes to prevent a disorderly exit of individual countries or dis disintegration of the Eurozone. Secondly, last week, the European Stability Mechanism, the Eurozone's permanent rescue fund, came into effect after months of infighting and having, among other things, survived a German, German constitutional court challenge in the form of the biggest 
class action ever brought in post-war Germany with over 30,000 signatures. And this fund provides a 700 billion backstop, billion euro backstop, for countries who risk losing access to capital markets. And thirdly and finally, Angela Merkel went to Athens last week, thereby signaling to the rest of the world that Germany does not want a Grexit or a Greek bailout. The change here is not limited to short-term fixes. The European Union system of economic governance has been fundamentally transformed over the last two years, and both sides of the divide have had to compromise conceding key positions. That is what I think a lot of the American criticisms and the Krugmans and the Soroses of this world miss. The creation of the Rescue Fund obliterates the no bailout clause of the Maastricht Treaty, a dogma that was to austerity-minded, moral hazard-hating Lutheran North Europeans what the infallibility of the Pope is to Catholics. The Southern European fiscal dogma, conversely, was any external limitations on moral hazard, equal infringements of national sovereignty, and are hence to be abhorred and repudiated. Get thee behind me. Well, now we have the six-pack legislation, which reinforces the European Commission's ability to monitor member states' fiscal policies and enforce debt limits. And the so-called fiscal compact, signed by 25 states, commits them to national deficit limits. Only the states that ratify the compact will be eligible for fund, rescue fund loans. And as Daniel Kellerman notes in a recent piece for Foreign Affairs, the bond markets too woke up to the fact that European governments would not underwrite their losses when private investors were forced to take a 75% haircut or write-off on re Greek bonds in the context of the February 2012 bailout. In short, and here I'd like to quote him, this new economic governance regime will be based on stronger fiscal surveillance, more robust enforcement procedures, more vigilant bond markets, and a more activist central bank. These are huge changes, and if I had dared to predict them two years ago, I would have been carted off to a sanatorium. It's also worth, worth noting that there have been important positive developments at the national level. Some, mostly northern European states like Latvia and Estonia, successfully underwent wrenching austerity diets after the crisis hit and are now much better off. Spain and Portugal have reduced their trade deficits through real export growth. Portugal, Spain, Italy, and yes, even Greece are making serious efforts to reform their economies, efforts that no one, again, would have dared to predict two years ago. Finally, it's worth noting that recent elections, for example, in the Netherlands or Greece itself, showed that voters are upset and fearful, but not to the degree that they would vote extremist parties into power. They have voted them in on the fridge, of course. Now, I don't want to be a Pollyanna or a Pangloss here. There's still a great deal to worry about, much indeed that could still trigger a catastrophic disintegration of the Union. Even if the risk of a Greek exit appears to have receded for the moment, a British exit is a frighteningly real possibility. If it happened, it would be a disaster for Europe and for Britain. Populist politics and secessionist movements are having something of a field day. And deep new fissures are springing up in Europe. The debate here used to focus on the specter of a two-speed Europe, with a core group moving ahead on integration and other nations following at a slower pace, but basically in the same direction. Now it looks as though we're headed for a much more permanent, potentially divisive, two-tier Europe, with the 17 Eurozone countries as in-group and the others condemned to hovering in a sort of non-Eurozone limbo. And worse still is the prosperity, welfare, and stability divide that is opening up between Europe's northern nations and the troubled economy, economies of the southeastern and southwestern rim of Europe, where precarity, poverty, political, and social tensions are rife. I don't need to tell you that. And in the end, of course, these divisions cannot be fixed with big gun ideas like Eurobonds or a European Marshall Plan. The remedies will be far more complex than that and far more politically difficult to achieve. Certainly, economic governance reform will not stop where it stands now. A likely menu of reforms will include greater macroeconomic coordination, regulation of financial <coughs> markets, further mutualization of debt, as well as growth policies. But the key question, of course, is another one. It's how much political union, political union, is necessary and feasible for Europe's governance to, to function. How much of Europe's political governance can remain at national level and how much needs to be federalized for the union to be an effective actor in global affairs? 
And at the federal level, how will we organize the separation and balance of powers and institutions? At the national level, what can be done to prevent dysfunctional institutions and processes from creating regional and even union-wide negative spillover effects, much less spillover effects that spread to over here? And finally, how will we convince Europe's citizens that they are living in a system that is stable, safe, and fair, that provides for accountability as well as solidarity, and that last but not least makes voters feel they have a voice in its affairs? Now, obviously, if I had answers to these questions, I would be the most sought-after wo uh, woman in Europe, and I probably wouldn't be standing here at this time. This is just to deflate expectations a little bit as I'm heading towards my ending. It's a an rhetorical technique. It's also true. But the scope and the range and the daring of the ideas that are currently being put, put forward, not just by academics and expert commissions, you know, the usual suspects, but by governments, including my own, do show that the Europeans have realized that the time for incremental piecemeal change is swiftly drawing to a close. We are looking at nothing less than a, a new era of architectural reform through, through Europe's front door, meaning treaty changes. And the EU summit, the first of three this year, which begins to, this Thursday, tomorrow, will be a first bellwether of how serious Europeans are about rising to meet the challenge. Now, I know you're waiting for me to say a few words about Germany. I'm happy to oblige. <laughs> Our history, and, I've, and you will not be surprised that I've been asked this one, I think, in every class that I've attended since Monday morning. And I will say our history, our geographic position, our size, as well as the current success of our economy, and you will note that I say current, all these beget a proportionate responsibility, and this includes a responsibility to lead. It did take us, the German government, and the German public, and above all, our own 21st century Iron Chancellor, Angela Merkel, a long, too long a time to acknowledge this, and the caution and incrementalism preferred always by Berlin have been maddening, including for many Germans and certainly for me. I wish Merkel had acknowledged earlier that no country in Europe has profited as much from the euro as Germany, and that German banks, in hoovering up the bad bonds spewed out by Spain, Ireland, and Portugal and Greece in their reckless um, public and private debt-making binges, share the moral blame for the disaster in much the same way as the man who pushes the alcoholic to have another drink, or the woman. And of course I wish that Merkel had gone to Greece last year rather than last week. But it is also only fair to acknowledge that we are now underwriting 190 billion of that 700 billion euro rescue fund, that the government and even our famously intransigent constitutional court have become far more flexible in key positions. And even more importantly, Germany is now pursuing economic and political union and producing ideas and blueprints for that. That said, I'd like to approach this question from a slightly more unconventional angle and perhaps one that's a little closer to home. Projection, as we know, is a very big part of the transatlantic relationship. Americans deplore, particularly in election season, Europeans' habits of projecting their wishes, desires, and fears onto American presidents and their challengers. If I may, I would suggest that this is a habit, a mental habit not alien to Americans either, and that when casting about for partners in burden sharing, they're looking for mirror images, well, smaller mirror images um, of themselves. I think this explains some of the more passionate exhortations to Germany to behave more like America. Now, the problem with this notion is a double one. Germany is not America, and Europe is not NATO. Duh. We are not a superpower and are not going to become one. We remain a mid-sized power that is good at some things and bad at others. And if you look at our demographics, we may look a lot more like Japan like, than like the US in 20 years. So Germany's current power is premised only, well, mostly, on its economic success. And that economic success is premised on our exports, 40% of which go to the Eurozone and the others go to China and to America which is only another way of saying that we are supremely vulnerable to the strength of demand and the economic health of those three buyers. And that's the first reason why Germany isn't really first among equals as America is in the EU, as America is at NATO. The other big reason, of course, is that, Europe is, that the European Union is not an alliance, but a sui generis, partly federalized union where economic power by no means translates automatically into political supremacy. And for details 
of this argument. I would urge you to go no further than a recent piece by Daniela Schwarzer and Kai Olaf Lang, friends of mine, both Germans, in Foreign Affairs, The Myth of German Hegemony. Unlike America, we are so deeply integrated and mutually dependent in Europe that a pullout by Germany, as for example advocated by George Soros, from the Euro is completely unrealistic, not gonna happen. It would be a disaster for us. It also means this dependence that we have far less leverage in political terms than our economic size would suggest. Unlike America, we can't send the troops. We can't even send diplomats with checklists of what we want allies to do. We have to convince, cajole, and barter. In other words, we have to deal with people on equal terms. All this means, as Schwarzer and Lang also note, that Germany will not be able to pressure others to adopt its rigid notions of fiscal austerity. In fact, it's lost a lot of European friends along the road. But it will have to make a lot more serious compromises down the road. Or to quote these authors, Berlin needs to be aware that stabilizing the euro and reforming the EU will not lead to a Germanized Europe. The crisis will not enable Germany to push through without restrictions its own vision of European integration. From my own observations, which are more in the foreign and security policy field, I have to say I couldn't agree more. So it won't, of course, be enough to fix the crisis and push for further economic and political integration. European politicians have to explain to European publics now why going through all this pain is going to be worth it. The conventional wisdom here is that we need a new narrative because the old narratives, historical enmities, the war, the Holocaust, post-war growth and prosperity, achieving the welfare state are dead and forgotten. Me personally, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> Forgive me. We're being taped, right? Oh dear. Edit that, please. Um, I think it's wrong. And we were talking about this uh, in class earlier. Parents' and grandparents' stories can be pretty powerful. And I think a lot of people in this room have parents' and grandparents' stories about austerity, about loss, about life as refugees, about wars, maybe even about the Holocaust. Those stories are very powerful, as can be the sight of charred ruins in the middle of a bustling capital city. We have some of those. And let's not forget that different parts of Europe have very different memories, some of them more recent but equally vivid as those of my grandparents and my parents as children. But if I had to propose a new narrative, um, how about this one? Europe's lack of internal coherence is threatening to roll back. Even the, the one thing that we took most for granted, the, the single market. And it is fast becoming irrelevant as a global actor. Its increasing inability to export Stability, rules, and prosperity to its periphery means that in the absence of other dominant players, that periphery will soon become a source of multiple risks seeping back in through our porous borders. So now we have a stark choice. We can decide to pull out the drawbridges, secure our resources in our aki, and become a gated community protected by a fortress. Or we can take that decisive step forward in European integration which alone will enable us to play an active role in redesigning, with the Americans, of course, a fair and decent rules-based global order. Surely, Europe's new narrative for the new millennium has to be that only integration allows it to shore up a liberal order at home and to export it abroad. So, and that's my final question, was last Friday's decision to award the Nobel Peace Prize to the EU justified? If we look at Europe's record, the answer has to be yes and no. But one thing, and I'm sure we will have questions about this for discussion, but one thing is certain. We can only become deserving of this honor if the European Union achieves the necessary economic and political reforms. So I would say to you that this prize is 100% justified as an incentive, as some people currently running for re-election here in America know. Thank you very much. <laughs>